got an idea for the next campaign I want to run, Ted. Oh, uh, what do you got? Eberron, Forgotten Realms, Spelljammer? No, 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 none of that. None of those games. It's not even D&D. We got Greyhawk, we got Theros, we got Ravnica. No, no, Ted, not even those. I said, just stop. It's not even Dungeons and Dragons. Whoa, whoa, whoa. what do you mean not D&D? Do we even do that? Yes, Ted, we've played plenty of D&D over the years. So let's talk about Move Over D&D. It's time for Cypher System from Monty Cook Games. Welcome to Nerdarchy for Nerds by Nerds. I'm Nerdarchist Dave, and as usual, I'm joined by this nerd. Nerdarchist Ted. If you want D&D and occasionally other RPG content to show up in your YouTube feed, make sure you hit that subscribe button. And if you want Nerdarchy's take on RPGs and D&D, then make sure you ring that notification bell. So today we're going to be talking about Cypher System for Mighty Cook Games. Uh, more specifically, we are about to wrap up a D&D game, our live channel uh, over on YouTube. So we want to play something different. And, you know, the other game we were wrapping up is Dungeons and Dragons. And now we're going to move into a Cypher System game. So we figured it'd be a perfect time to discuss that, talk about that a little bit. If you want to check out that game we're wrapping up or the other things we do over on the live channel, you know, uh, interviews and live chats with industry people and personalities, there will be a link in the description to do that. But right now we're going to jump into it. And we're going to talk about Cypher System as well as like the game that we're going to be playing over there a little bit. All right, so I guess, you know, like we have to look at the, the core of what the Cypher system is before we go too far into it. Uh, and it's a, you know, uh, genre open style game. Cypher is set up that you can basically run any kind of game using this particular rule set. Yeah, it, it's a generic RPG. You know, it's not fantasy. It's not sci-fi. It's whatever you want it to be. It's It's actually... The stripped down mechanics from Numenera, from the Numenera system, from uh, from Monty Cook Games, which was kind of like a science fantasy game, and now you can go you know, use the generic version to run any kind of game you want with it. They also use this to run other games like The Strange, and there's probably some other ones that I'm not even you know thinking of that you could could play. So where do you want to start, Ted? Do you want, we want to start with like how the game plays, or you know about building the characters. So I think you know most people you know will probably be interested in the actual characters. So why don't we start there? All right. So building the character, you, you kind of start with a character state statement. If you're familiar with Fate, it's similar to that, um, but the similarities kind of end there. So basically. I am an objective noun with who verbs, right? And that that one sentence defines your character. So your uh, so your adjective is going to be your descriptor. Your noun is going to be your character class, or in this case, type. And your verb is your your foci or your focus. Uh, and that's really you know how your character does what they do. Yeah, so for our classes, they're kind of generic, and you can kind of theme them according to what kind of genre you're playing. But you're going to be either playing a warrior, an adept, an explorer, or a speaker. All right, so your warrior is what you would expect. You know, this is the the ones who are, you know, are typically stronger and are willing to charge in the battle. Your explorer, it's kind of built into the name. They're the ones that are actually, you know, willing and able to go out into the dangers of the world. Your adept, this is going to be your more spellcastery type class. And your speaker, this is going to be your face character, the, the one that is far more involved in the social aspects of role-playing games. Yeah, if you wanted to put this in kind of D&D terms, if that's the game you're familiar with, your warrior is going to be your fighters, your rangers, your paladins, maybe even your monks. Your, your, your adept character is going to be your cleric, sorcerer, wizards, warlocks. Your explorer essentially is your rogue, possibly even your bard. But we also have speaker, which is a face character. So that is also could be your bard either. It just depends on where you want to lean into with it. And, and it, the unique thing about this is no matter what type you choose, you can kind of go to the, the other direction. Like if you're playing in adept, you could actually take some things that makes you make you a lot more like a warrior. Um, and you could do that for any of the types. Yeah, they blend and cross really well, especially when you begin to figure out what you're doing with your stats or in this game pool, uh, what you're going to do with your descriptor uh, and your focus. The, these are going to really, really give your character a theme and you know an overall package that's going to give you exactly what you want and fill the niche that you're looking to play. 
So now with the types, that's only, what they're going to really do is determine how your stats kind of play out, right? They, they, they have defaults depending on what you choose. And then there's other things that can kind of alter that. So with that, you know, let, let's kind of delve into the stats themselves. Uh, what do we got, Ted? Uh, it's pretty simple. There's only three stats in the game to worry about. And you have a might pool, a speed pool, and an intellect pool. And each uh, each class or type that you that you select gives you your starting bracket, and then you get a number of points to add as you see fit. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously, if you play like a warrior, you know, you're going to be focused on might or speed. You know, that adept is your, more of your intellect. Your explorer again is probably going to be speed, maybe intellect. Speaker again, intellect. Because those are where the those stats, whichever is important to you, that's going to probably determine how you choose your type. Now we're going to get into ways to modify your character in Cipher, and you know essentially we have uh, three different ways that we're going to modify those types. All right, so you mentioned that there's three ways to you know build out your character beyond the type, and we've mentioned descriptor. This is a you know the short little adjective that helps identify what we're doing mentioned focus which is a more you know a uh, more broader thing that is going to really coat this character with a with a paintbrush and give them a proper theme that we want to work with but there's another option and that's going to be flavor uh, and what that is is you can add a technology a stealth or magic you know a, a variety of different options that are going to give you uh, a way that you switch out things from your other choices to give you this overall design that you're looking for. So you mentioned flavors and flavors modifies your type. It might actually let you do some of the things that the other types do or something completely different. And what it is, you're gonna get a certain number of things you choose from your type in the beginning of the game. And you can swap them out for things in your flavor so that it can totally change things up. You know, you mentioned descriptor. There is, you know, there is tons of options, over 50 options. You have your foci or your focus, and this is the one area where two characters probably shouldn't choose the same one because this is going to be like a defining factor. But I feel like the game is flexible enough, even if you may did and you had a bunch of other choices, you'd probably still be a lot different. But you might run into some areas where you're going to step on each other's toes. So it is a consideration. So, you know, when you when you look at these things, you know, the descriptors, you know, not all of them are, you know, something that seem super positive. You know, we were we were, you know, talking about this uh, last night and it was like, oh, you know, we see things like doomed, naive, clumsy, uh, you know, and this sounds like, oh, is this a flaw? Is this a bad thing? They're, they're not. You know, they might add some some really cool things that your character might not be able to do otherwise, but might also offer some hindrances as well that you might want to use as good role-playing tools. Uh, the character that I'm actually playing, I chose Doomed because I think it was very thematic for the campaign that, that Dave has put forth and could be a lot fun to role-play. There is a, you know, a mechanical deficit that makes my character advance a little bit slower, but it's not that big a deal for the benefits that you get right at the beginning. When you look at your focus, these are things that, you know, can be a lot of fun. The, the names are very descriptive, evocative of, you know, character types. And sometimes when you're reading, it makes you really like, oh, wow, this jumps off the page. This is something I really want to do. Uh, but as Dave says, like, if you have two characters who choose the same focus, it can be a challenge unless you're two different types or character classes, because a warrior who bears a halo of fire and an adept who bears a halo of fire might function very differently based on the things that they're, they're taking and doing. The warrior might be a very melee-based, fire-driven character, while the adept is in the background throwing fire. And if you're going up against things that hate fire, all the better. But as Dave says, I do think it is wise to choose things that are different to give each character the chance to stand out and shine throughout the course of the game. And it shouldn't be too hard. There's so many different options. Now, when we look at uh, Cypher System, the, there are six tiers of play. This is essentially how you advance through the game. You know, you're going to get XP. You get to spend that XP to buy new abilities, to get better at things. And, you know, within each tier, there's like four things that you can advance. And once you've advanced them all, you've moved to the next tier. You know, so essentially, you know, after you've advanced 24 things or so, you've already progressed through all the tiers. Um, and also when you start your characters in this game, you kind of get a fleshed out and, 
and finished character just over the course of the tiers of play they're just going to keep getting you know slightly better now the rules do say that the the characters are a established character at first first tier or first level uh and it is something that's like oh you know some of the background options that you can choose is like oh I've already written a book on this and I'm well known for it. Or, you know, this other thing that I'm done, I've got, I've already built a name. So these aren't just your low level peons that you would expect from a typical D&D game. They are a little bit more advanced and, you know, beyond what your typical average person would do within, you know, the lands of Cypher or within, you know, whatever your, you know, core setting is going to be. So you do really get the ability to, to, shine above the, the the normal folk if you will and you know when you do this kind of stuff you know it is supposed to be things to help advance the story advancement is great and you know anyone who's played rpgs really does like that kind of stuff or at least you know those who i've gamed with do uh, but cypher does say that you can play a game and not change tiers of play throughout the course of a short campaign the longer you go, the harder it is to play. I know our group has already determined like what the expected XP gain is per session. Um, you know, so this is something that is you know really cool to, to work with and and look at when you're actually exploring you know the the cipher system. Yeah, absolutely. So with that, let's you know since you we're talking about tiers and playing and campaigns, let's move into the gameplay a little bit. You know. In Cypher System, you do not use a lot of dice. Uh, you're gonna only you're only gonna need your D20, D6, and D100, and the majority of that you're going to be using that D20. Yeah, that D20 is going to be set with you know a typical difficulty chart that you're that you're looking at. Every task that you're going to do has a certain uh, number, uh, anywhere from you know one to ten, uh, and you know that seems pretty simple. And then the, the DM sets your DC or, you know, your, your target number, uh, which is the difficulty times three, just to, you know, add a little bit of challenge factor into it and making it work within the rules of the D20. Because let's face it, you cannot roll a 30 on a D20. Uh, so that, that does make that defining D20 still your staple, but not easy to get unless you find a way to reduce that overall difficulty or gain some kind of you know bonus or asset in order to achieve those numbers beyond 20. Some interesting facts as we're talking about the D20 for Cypher System is only the players roll the d20 the uh, gm actually doesn't roll the dice they set the difficulty of the challenge and then the players have to overcome that challenge whether it's to hit an enemy defend against an enemy or figure out a puzzle it's all on the players that you know the dm gm has kind of washed their hands of it they're not going to be rolling any dice now your d6s are only used for recovery you're kind of healing uh, so it'll get used, but not not nearly as often as that D20. And then you're going to also have a D100 is literally only there to randomly generate things. That's all you're going to use it for. That'll probably be the least used of the dice. So Dave, your secret's out. You know your your bad dice rolling luck. If uh, you know ha has uh, has come to fruition, be like, ha ha, I'm the GM here. I don't ever have to roll dice. Well, that is true. But you know, there's been plenty of games where I roll well as the GM, just never as a player. <laughs> So kind of getting into it, um, we had discussed your pools a little bit earlier, and you know we said you they're, they're your stats, right? Correct. That's your might, your speed, and your intellect. And the, so, and the average character on, on those is going to start between a nine and a twelve, uh, with for your starting stats, and then whatever is going to be your favored stat is probably going to be a little bit higher. Uh, so like those are things to consider. And what these things these pools become, they. They become your stats, but they also become your hit points. And it's also a resource in the game that you can spend in order to get better at doing things. So like we mentioned, you know, there can be a challenge 30, but you can't roll a 30 on a D20. Well, there's things that you can do in the game that increase the likelihood of doing that. We have things called edge and effort. The more edge we have, less expensive it is for us to exert effort. Effort is one of those mechanics in the game that allow us to reduce the challenge. So, you know, if we were to reduce a challenge by six tiers, right, of effort, which would be very expensive to do, but in theory, you could do it. 
that would that would take that 30 down by 18 points essentially uh making it much more manageable now that that's getting pretty complicated there are there are a number of ways to to reduce it uh between being proficient uh, in, in a particular skill is going to bring it down. Uh, having some kind of asset is going to give you uh, a bonus, as well as, you know, as Dave says, uh, you know, applying effort. So effort is limited by your effort score, and that's going to be linked to your tier and your effort score. Your effort score is not going above your 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 tier or the tier you're working towards. So you can you can expend XP to level up your effort score, uh, but only once per tier. So once you get to six tier, that's how you can get an effort of six. But it costs points from your pool. It costs three points to apply one level of effort and then two additional points for every level thereafter. So it would cost you 13 stat points to apply six levels of effort if you actually had that much to spend. But that's where your edge is going to come into play as well, because your edge for a particular stat is going to allow you to reduce that number from that particular stat. So if I had an edge uh, or intellect edge of six and I was doing an intellect based skill and I needed to apply six levels of effort, we're at the final you know, campaign finale. There is a puzzle here that we need to solve. I could absolutely, you know, expend that much. So that 13 points that I would be spending for my intellect pool, which would be at six tier of play, much higher than 13, I would be able to reduce my intellect's cost for effort by six, bringing that actually only down to seven, not too drastic for a, you know, maximum tier play. Yeah, and you know, effort is only one of the ways that you can d decrease the difficulty or and increase your chances. It's, it's the most complicated, so you know, just know that it's part of the game. Um, modifiers is another way, and that you know, that's going to consist of skills, gear, and circumstances. All can lower the difficulty. Um, you have skills where you're either proficient or specialized. You have assets which you can add up to two. All of these things it can you know increase your your chances of success um and then there's all things also things that impair and hinder which can do the opposite and make those checks more difficult so we won't get into it too deeply this is really just meant to be a overview uh, next up we have things like attacking and damage where you don't have specific weapons per se in cypher system you're gonna have light weapons medium weapons and heavy weapons and they go two four and six for damage and light weapons actually are easier to hit with. So like we mentioned like those assets earlier that would give you an asset and make it easier to hit and lower the difficulty. Yeah, these, these things are, are pretty cut and dry and it's up to you, the player, to discuss with your GM what you want to designate as your particular weapon. The rule book does give you some options for you know what each category would entail and it is across multiple uh, you know, genres. So whether you're playing a DD and d game or a fantasy game, or whether you want to go to all the way to like, you know, stellar combat, you know, type things where you're, you know, wielding rocket launchers and heavy blasters. Yeah, a battle axe and a shotgun that shoots slugs most might both be heavy weapons that you use in the game. Uh, next up, uh, you can wear armor in the game, like many games that you're used to. The difference is armor doesn't make you any harder to hit. It reduces the amount of damage you take. So you're going to have an armor type and it's going to have a classification. And based on that, you're just going to take less damage. So, you know, so that's a little bit different than if you're used to playing a D&D &D game. You know, armor is yeah. going, to, going to fall into the same categories that you're used to with D&D, &D, light, medium, and heavy armor. Uh, and of course, you know you need proficiencies with those particular things in order to do it. Uh, the warrior class is going to get it. Explorer class has easy access to being able to get access to all three if they want. So you definitely have the ability to gain access to those things and, you know, play as you will. The final thing in our kind of overview to mention is XP and GM intrusions. We already kind of mentioned XP is this thing that you spend to improve your character, but you can also use it during the game for several different things. One of them is is to re-roll a die roll. If you don't like it, you can spend an XP and re-roll it. Uh, the other place is you can refuse a GM intrusion. But with that, we should probably talk about GM intrusions. 
So a GM intrusion is, you know, when a when something is happening and the GM feels like I need to make something more challenging for, you know, the character who is currently going, uh, you know, I'm going to offer up a GM intrusion. When this happens, the player who it's happening to gets a bonus XP and an XP to give out to one of their allies. If they accept it, Whatever happens, the GM says, this is what's going on. It could be like they have to, you know, re-roll what's going on. It could be we enter into a scene that's difficult for that character or any number of, you know, different options. Uh, if they refuse it, they have to give an XP that they have accrued previously back to the GM. You know, a great, a great example is you're playing a superhero game. You're playing Spider-Man and Spider-Man is breaking up a bank robbery. Oh, no. Aunt May is in the line, uh, at, you know, for the next teller in the bank. Aunt May could be in danger now. What does the character playing Spider Man do? Because now there's this added complication of not only do they have to defeat the bank robbers and stop the bank from being robbed, but they have to make sure Aunt May doesn't get shot in the process. You know, in that in that same you know scenario, as opposed to Aunt May, you know, if you're going with the uh, you know creating the web device. Spider-Man could run out of ammunition. You know, he could run out of his out of his webs, and you know he could have to put in a, a new disc or put in a new cartridge, or maybe he just doesn't have any in general, and he's got to go back home, and he has to spend the rest of this encounter without those things. So these are simple things that you can do. But when it comes to gaining the XP, as Dave says, there are four different things that you need to level up your tier, and each of those four things costs four XP. So you can accrue and the moment that you have it, you have four XP. You can choose right now, I'm going to spend that four XP and and accrue this thing. I'm you know increase my edge, increase my effort, increase my stats, or gain some skills. Uh you know, or you know, gather something from my individual uh you know tier of class or type. So these are things that you can spend your XP and, and gain. So it could be, well, I've been working on this particular skill and up until the time that I need it, um, don't really consider myself that proficient. But as you go into this, you know, puzzle challenge where you have to jump across, you know, these, you know, floating rocks or fall into a, a heavy moving rapids, you're like, you know what? I think right now might be a good time. I'm going to spend four XP and my character is now proficient in jumping uh, because I needed a, you know, you know, I needed this skill option. So boom, you've got it. And now you, you know, your difficulty is easier because you are lowered that difficulty because you're now proficient in jumping skill. Or even going with our earlier example, example of Spider-Man, think about Spider-Man the first time he decides to make a web parachute. That might be a new power that you just acquired by spending your XP because you had them there. Uh, and that, that would also be kind of like a thematic way where you can think about how you might have seen it in other media before. So you can think about it along that way, that, those lines as well. So that is Cypher System in a nutshell. There's a bit more to the game. Uh, but hopefully this is enough to whet your appetite and go seek more information. We've had pl fun playing it. We're about to start our own campaign with it, which you'll be able to check it out. I'm running a game that's going to be kind of a hodgepodge of Thundar the Barbarian meets Flash Gordon meets the Herculoids, kind of a post-apocalyptic science fantasy game uh, that will be running over on the uh, Nerdarchy live channel, which you can go check out. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, you know, the characters that are in, that are already being discussed are going to be fun. They're going to be thematic to the setting that Dave has put forth. Uh, you know, we're going to be playing Tuesday nights at 8 o'clock Eastern Standard Time over on the Nerdarchy Live channel. Hey, you want more Cypher System? Here's a flip through we did. Expanded Cypher System role-playing game flip through and first look many times we discuss other rpgs over on our weekly patron only live chat that's not all every month we create 5e content for gms and players alike we have a monthly giveaway our patrons are automatically entered in and more so until next time stay, stay nerdy, nerdy.